Okay, so now, fast forward or slow forward into the <laughs> 1700s, now take us to the 1800s. Scientific revolution time, also actual revolution time for a variety of countries. Um, also, America. Yeah. <laughs> America. America. America and, America. And, and of course, France. France. They're writing to each other and corresponding and setting Wait, up they, experiments. They. Boyle, Gassendi, um, Newton, Leibniz, mm -hmm. um, the, the people who were still philosopher physicists in the 1700s and 1800s. They're also now working with Newton's Principia. And it's known pretty early on that the Principia doesn't answer everything. Like the law of gravity is action at a distance because it just says if, I mean, imagine a universe with nothing in it. If two masses just popped into existence, they would somehow immediately feel the force between the two, right? Okay. And there's no like time for the force of gravity to travel and say, hey, other planet, this is what you should feel toward me. Um, no, it's instantaneous. So people knew there were issues. And one of the main people was Emily du Chatelet, who wrote a book called The Foundations of Physics. Ooh. Right, so before, you know, maybe- When was that? I'm, I'm gonna pick that is, up. She's in the mid 1700s. Thank you for that. And she's experiencing a renaissance right now. For a long time, she was just known as like Voltaire's lover and mistress, and she hosted many salons. <laughs> Salon. This Salon. is how I feel about. I don't know. I don't know how to say French things. Okay. Go ahead. So I just I want to just make sure the timeline is established here. Right. So Newton's greatest work was done in the 1600s, 1687. spilling spilling into early the 17. early 1700s. Voltaire comes around mid 1700s, a little earlier, yeah, a little earlier, I think. And so, and your and Du Chatelet is the same time. Du Chatelet, and yeah. so they're they're coincident in time. That's right. Yes, and she's so she's hosting a lot of the intellectuals of the time, and like they're having interesting conversation. But she's also in charge of teaching her kid, her her son. Uh, physics, and she's disappointed with all the textbooks, and she she does what many people do. She writes her own, and the first thing she does, so as, as one does, as one exactly. does. Did, you did that with your kids you too. See all the textbooks yeah. my kids are reading. <laughs> <laughs> They're all wrong because I wrote it. <laughs> Do you put as like the byline is like Lord of Comedy, <laughs> comma your father? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, she before writing this book of foundations, which again starts with a philosophical framework and goes from there. It starts with the principle of sufficient reason and the law of non-contradiction and the rule of like sort of proper reason. Wait, law of? Do they declaring that it's a law? It's an axiom. Okay. Yeah, you have to start somewhere. So. Okay, so you lay down some rules. That's right. right. Rules and regulations. Yeah, and you then, gotta bite the bullet somewhere. And, and what follows derives within those constraints. Yes. Okay, okay. gotcha. So, but she's also the one who translated the, the Principia into French. And I guess like current French physicists still read her translation, but she didn't just translate the Latin into French. She filled in gaps. Like she wrote a thick commentary. Wow. And so it was her physics That's that has trained. You look, pull, yeah. pull out Newton say, Newton, yeah. you need help. Here's what yeah. you left out, Newton. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And so it was, people kind of got it. Like, he's not telling us everything. He's given us some parameters, but there's more work to be done if we want to really know why things work the way they do. So, um, and, and how many lady physicists existed at the time? Hard to know because, again, this physics philosophy split isn't totally there. So while there were just a few women, maybe, who were doing experiments of any kind, um, I'm not sure I know any, there are a lot of women doing philosophy. Wow. Um, corresponding with Leibniz, corresponding with Hume, um, interacting, like writing, influencing Leibniz's thought. Like, Interesting, because I have a yeah. book which is Leibniz's letters. Yeah. And, there, and there's all manner of people yeah. that are on the other side of those letters. I, I'll yeah. take another look at them. Yeah. Why we all know Leibniz today. Just tell Chuck. Newton both developed calculus more or less at the same time, which I'm sure you woke up this morning saying, you know what? I'm dying to know <laughs> who invented the calculus at the same time as Newton. But anyway, um, he thought that space was not a substance. It wasn't a thing. It was just the relationships between stuff, okay. a relational view. And so he objected to the idea of um, Newtonian absolute space and absolute time, which is not really a stuff either, but it exists independent of matter. So it's like a thing in Newton's ontology. Like when he's listing the stuff that exists, space is there. Space is part of it. But for Leibniz, it just is how we understand the difference between, the, the distance between matter. I'm confused here. Yeah. 
there are two independent calculus <laughs> and they both work. <laughs> they, they, Does that sound yeah. weird? You know they're different because all the notation is different. Yeah. And in physics, we retain a lot of Newton's notations. Okay. But in pure math, it's all Leibniz's. You know, the oh. integral signs and all these squiggly yeah. right. symbols. That's Leibniz, right? That's Leibniz, yeah. 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 That's all Leibniz. Okay. And so Leibniz is a little more elegant than Newton's. Newton mm -hmm. was like, let's get in and get the job done and get out kind of mm -hmm. thing. All right. But I'm impressed that that it would happen at this basically the same time and yeah. independently. I love calculus. I don't know why people give it such a bad well, rap. I didn't. Now, now you, that's the thing I never thought I'd hear this morning. <laughs> I so love when calculus. I woke up this morning, that's what I thought I'd never hear. <laughs> is, is that a bumper sticker on your car? I love calculus. I don't calculus. have a car, oh, okay. but if I did, that would be one of them for sure. All right. So now we got them. Now take okay. us now into the 19th century. As technology gets better, we get, we're able to The industrial to get, revolution. Yes. And all these, like we start moving from talking about forces and inertia and stuff where they can't fully analyze. Um, and we, we start getting quantitative about conservation of energy and about like tweaking frog legs so we can understand how muscles work and psychology is coming into its own and sociology is coming like the different fields start to distinguish themselves and at the same time like universities are being built and growing and the different faculty at universities are getting set up um professional societies like the royal society and the paris society of scientists um, are growing. So now you have communities growing up where people mm -hmm. share their findings and it's international, at least in the West, um, and so on. It's it's a long and interesting story, which I, other people could probably give a better version of, but it's this increasing um, ability to quantize uh, and specialize. The more we learn, the more there is to sort of, you know, I was thinking the other day, wouldn't it be great if we lived at the time of the Library of Alexander? Because, like, you could really have said, I've read all the books in the world. Yeah, wow, I, look I, at that. I, I, this I is think, not possible I think anymore. at least, I think that was true up until much later than that. Really? Like, in, rumor has it, I've heard, I'm heard told, that up through the 1500s, highly educated people could have claimed to have read everything that was ever written. Yeah. Well, that's because well, it was all handwritten. <laughs> Real slow. Yeah, yeah but some it's people like pretty, Aquinas, they had scribes. They had like a room yeah. full of monks uh, writing for uh, them. Just writing on mm -hmm. sheets. Mm -hmm. yeah. As they go into these communities, when does all of this lead to what we are? Because none of this stuff is cross-pollinating today. Well, I, I wouldn't say none of it is. I would say it's harder to do. Okay. And I'd say people are still asking these questions. Um, it's, but we've built, and we talked touch on this last time, we've built up our universities in a way that we actively discourage people from staying as general as possible. Okay. Um, liberal arts training is is being kicked like a, a poor little puppy, and it's like <laughs> such an important thing. Right. Um, and then when you get to graduate school, it's all over. It used to be like you would try to say general, even through your master's degree, you would take a little bit of, like you would learn everything. Are you saying it's important because it, it just kept you loose? Yeah. It kept you learning a bunch of other stuff. Other stuff. Just and appreciating. Kept the, the dimensions of yeah. life and yeah. of society. Right. So, I mean, I'm going to jump all the way to the Cold War era. And if people are interested, like there is good history on this. And one book in particular is The Physicists by Daniel Kevles. It might be a little outdated by now, but it just talks about the history of physics in the U.S. and how it became so many different specializations and so on. Um, but it was only after the Manhattan Project and after World War II that physics was properly like considered a thing you could be, have as a career. It wasn't just something you learned as a young man at the university or one of the few women, um, but it was something you could have, a, you could bring home the bacon, right? If you actually did physics but or engineering But at that point, physics is making bombs. They're, do, right. they're, they're, they're important for national security. And, and no one is talking about philosophy at that point. Um, so that's when the transition kind of happens. It becomes, in the U.S., very pragmatic. It's about the shut up and calculate mentality, and that really dominates through the Cold War era because there's this, it's competition. Um, but interestingly, in the 50s and 60s, James Conant, who was the president of Harvard and a yeah. physicist and a chemist. I didn't remember that. About Conant that. Um, fought really hard for even his physics students to know the history and philosophy. He understood it as so important that he built it into Harvard's program that even if you were just studying physics, it wouldn't be like writing down lab notes and doing calculations. You would also take a history and philosophy of science course. You're saying explicitly and implicitly that coming out of the 19th century into the 20th, especially post-war, mm -hmm. the field of physics has, has borders 
in a, in a way yeah, yeah. where other ways of thinking can't get in. Yeah. And you're saying that's to the detriment of physics, not to the detriment of other fields. How would you characterize that? I think it's the de to the detriment of any field, not just science, when those walls became impermeable. Um, I think walls are a very good thing. <laughs> stop it. Stop. Physics, as far as I can tell today, still suffers from this border problem. It makes sense because we're on we're, we get hyper specialized because we know so much and we're building on so much we're asking just that many more questions and we have that much more technology to explore so i mean the blossoming of many flowers is a good thing so how do we use you <laughs> well maybe i don't want to be used <laughs> okay okay sorry <laughs> maybe i how, get how, to be exist in my own right because it's a beautiful you, and wonderful uh, human endeavor uh, it came out wrong no uh, i know uh, what you mean how yeah. do you help us okay we help each other when we share ideas when we um have conversations like we're doing now. So for instance, I was just talking about Mach. He was an important influence in Einstein. When Einstein wrote an obituary that everybody read for Mach, he said, one of the reasons I hold this person in such high esteem as a physicist is because he kept asking about what is the proper goal of science? And that guided how he did science. But what is the proper goal of science is like a, a guiding principle it is itself a philosophical principle. The same as we might say um, at a more intimate level in physics, like that choosing something that's parsimonious or beautiful or simple or whatever. There's no reason why the earth should, or why nature should give a damn about those principles. About our aesthetics. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that nature is uniform at all is something you have to assume to even think science is worth doing in the first place. So like, there are moments you have to sort of buy into certain untestable principles to consider science worth doing.